the <laughs> offseason re-signing of a player that you are familiar with, and, and that is OG Ananobi, a five-year, $212 million deal with the Knicks. How did you react when you first heard the uh, the news? Well, I reacted uh, in dismay a little bit because I missed it by about five minutes. I was doing NBA radio at the draft with Justin Termini and uh, Eddie Johnson, and I had my phone down. And we had missed each other. OG and I had missed each other that day. I'd missed a call from him around 3.30. Then I tried to call back. And long story short, here comes uh, Woj's break of the news at about 6.15, 6.16, whatever it was. I flip up my I flip over my phone uh, a minute or two later, and there's a text from OG five two fourteen. Uh, thank you, Coach. You know, one of those deals, and um, uh, I, I was just I was just so happy. I mean, it was just I can't happy doesn't probably do justice to it, but it, it just was so excited for him because I know how much uh, being respected as one of the best players. Uh, not only on a team, but in the game with the future that he has and what he wants to accomplish. And and money sometimes is a scorecard for that, obviously. And and he got it. And uh, I just, throughout the rest of that time with the draft, before I got on the phone with him about an hour later, um, I was just giddy with it because I know what he puts into it. I know exactly what he does, how he works, how he continues to work, how he worked when we had him. And I know what's in his heart, and I know how he thinks, and I know his goals. So I was completely, completely happy for him. And when, when, when you get that text, and it's thank you, Coach, and you're one of the first people to find out about it, all the work that you put in with a player at the collegiate level from recruitment all the way down you know, through their matriculation, what, what does that feel like to you as a coach? Um, it, on, on a human level, it's unbelievable because, you know, we have a great relationship and, and we've had one for a long time and you don't build any great relationship without going through hard times. And we did. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And, and, um, but he is as loyal that, that old adage is loyal as the day is long, doesn't do justice to who he is. I tell people like, uh, you'd be shocked how many former managers that we had at Indiana that they invite him and he shows up at the wedding. I mean, it's just who he is. I mean, he's he he's he is who he is. And there there's he's gonna give sound bites, but he's not sitting there thinking about those sound bites. He's uh he's an introspective guy, he's unbelievably smart. I, I don't know many people that have the memory and the recall that he has, especially where he feels he's been slighted. Mm. All right. And and so I'll get some of those sometimes about a game I didn't play him as much in, or I should have let him shoot more. We should have raised his release point earlier, you know, all those different types of things. And he doesn't forget anything. And and but just with seeing that and knowing how important it was uh, for him to be somewhere um, that that embraced him. And they did because he loved Toronto. I mean, there's just no doubt about that. He loved it. It was his home. You know, he 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 made a home in Milton, Georgia. That's where he has a house and he travels all over the country, really the world at times. Uh, not only for travel, but to play and work out with different people or at different places. But Toronto was his home, and they'd raised him since he was 19. And, and to me, that was really, really hard for him when he left. But he went to such a great place. And, I mean, when he went to New York, there wasn't one single doubt in my mind he was going to impact not only the Knicks, but impact the East because of what he brought. And And I think uh, I said it then, like, I thought that was the closest Tom had had to Jimmy Butler. Mm. And when you talk to Tom, Tom sees a lot of what he had in Luel Dang. And and so you combine those two guys and what they did offensively, defensively, and the fact that OG just had his 27th birthday the other day. Uh, there's so much in front of him, so much in front of him that, that's in his career. Yeah, that was one of the things that you said when, when you made the media rounds, when the Knicks made that blockbuster trade, was you said, this changes things in the East. And had the Knicks stayed fully healthy, we, we might have been speaking of this team in a different way, even though they had a tremendous run. What was it, you know, skill set-wise and overall fit with the team that, that made you say that? A versatility defensively, that, that first and foremost, because he can guard one through five. And he's been doing that since basically about January of his freshman year with us at Indiana. And and what what he brings, he doesn't get beat off the dribble. It doesn't matter if it's a guard. And, and there was a stat that one of the teams gave me in the draft process 
and I could be a little wrong on the size, but I think it was six four and above. Uh, he was the number one prospect in that draft uh, at not fouling the dribbler, at not mm. fouling the man with the ball, which just spoke volumes about not only his length and his and his stance, but his balance and and his ability to stay in front of the ball. And not not to mention the fact he's so strong with his legs and he's and he and he's and he's strong in the upper body, but he's incredibly smart. So the versatility, mm. the intelligence. The ability to play without the ball, um, the ability to do what's asked, the ability to be able to impact the game on both ends of the floor through the randomness of the game, right? And and through all the different things that happen in the game, being able to attack long closeouts, being able to space, being able to cut, being able to knock down threes. And I think we saw in that game that he got hurt, you know, where he had the hamstring injury, we were able to see what he was able to do off the dribble. So, like, I, I look at two OGs. I look at the one that people see, but I also look at the one that he is behind the scenes and what he's preparing to be. And he's the same person, and it's the same work ethic, but there's so much in front of him based on his skill level and his work level and what he wants to accomplish. And But the, but the great thing about OG is he wants to accomplish it within the – within I shouldn't say the constraints, but within the confines of the team. Team. He wants to be he, – he's a team guy. He's always been. And, and and he impacts teammates. And and what is really great about him, and, and you know this from being around the game as much as you are, not everybody always wants to see their teammates be successful, and certainly not at the expense of them. Now, he is a guy that truly wants to see his teammates be successful. I've been fortunate to coach some guys uh, that are really like that. And OG is, is really right at the top of that list with the others because – he wants to see guys be successful. He wants to win. And, and he's a very, very coachable guy. And and I think that's that's one of the reasons I was excited about him going with Tom and that staff, because I knew he would continue to get coached at a high level. Yeah, and, and those things that, that you mentioned, it just jumped off the chart. The first game against Minnesota, New Year's Day at Madison Square Garden, and those same things, his cutting ability, playing without the ball. At one point, he's guarding Carl Anthony Towns. and another point, he's guarding Anthony Edwards. I mean, just, just being a, a Swiss Army knife, one through five, was so impressive. They go 20 and three with him during the regular season with him in that lineup. I think that's like 87% winning percentage. And then I was at the game, game four, in Philadelphia when there's no Julius Randle. Josh Hart is in foul trouble. Uh, Mitchell Robinson uh, at that point was, was, uh, was injured as well. And in the fourth quarter in crunch time, you're seeing OG Ananobi front Joel Embiid, ball denial, and being effective. And it led to the Knicks winning that game in the fourth quarter with OG Ananobi on um, primary defender on Joel Embiid. That was incredible. No question about it. And and he can do that. And you go back even to his freshman year, you know, his sophomore year with us, as most people know, he didn't get to finish the year. He got hurt at Penn State. He tore his ACL with 18 games to go, which was just a crusher for us, because at that point in time, he was he was a highly projected lottery pick inside of that. Well, I think after the surgery and through the draft process, most people almost looked at it like it was going to be a redshirt year for him going into the draft. And he fell to Toronto. Well, it wasn't. And he started all these games on the number one seed in the East, playing for Dwayne Casey, who we absolutely loved playing for, brought him a lot of confidence. And here's a guy that in the first round of the playoffs, he's switching back and forth between Bradley Beal and John Wall. And in the second round against the Cavaliers, he's guarding LeBron. And so that's all is a rookie. And to me, that that is what's just absolutely incredible about him is that um, whatever he's whatever tasked to do, he's going to do it. And, and I think with what they have now with the Knicks, especially when they go with smaller lineups, now there's not just one guy. Now, obviously, Mitchell Robinson is different, just like Hartenstein was different in this. But now there's not just one guy like OG or Julius Randle that has to spend the game guarding the five and banging there. You know, OG, yeah. that was a great example. He's guarding Maxi early in that game, and then he's guarding Embiid, and he can guard anybody else in between. And he just provides you so much. You, you, you have a blueprint for what you want to do defensively. But now, and Tom's got as good as blueprint as anybody in the NBA. But now the flexibility that not only you have with OG, but now you bring in Mikael Bridges. And that flexibility that that gives you, there's really, there's really not any situation they're not going to have an answer for. 
defensively on anybody in the East or in the NBA for that matter. And a lot of it's because OG is absolutely fearless, committed, and smart as, as can be on what he needs to do to defend people at the position and to their strengths and weaknesses. And you mentioned that the versatility that he came into Indiana with. Was there a particular skill set or an area where you felt like you guys needed to coach him up that we're seeing now at the at the NBA level? Well, I think early on, speed of the game. He wasn't highly recruited. I think he was ranked like 278. He had numerous offers, but to my knowledge, I think he only had one or two offers in the entire state of Missouri. And then he was from Jefferson City, Missouri. The, the story that it always bears repeating, we go to the Under Armour Classic in Atlanta, um, and and it's, it's a huge classic, and we're going to watch Team Thad, which is coached by Norton Third, and Thad is, it's Thad is Young's team. So we're mm-hmm. going to see another player. And all of a sudden, we're sitting there. We've paid our for three people our $750. And I'm watching this guy with a headband and floppy hair and this long wingspan, and he's guarding the ball, and he's trapping the ball, and he's running the floor. And, like, he's not in the book. <laughs> His name <laughs> was not in the book. So I beeline at halftime over to the scores table. Certainly a violation, I'm sure, but that's okay. It was worth it. I walk over there. You get his last name. Well, I can't pronounce it yet at that point. And so, but there's no first name. So, like, I'm mesmerized watching him. And we continue to watch him over the next couple of days, learning little bits and pieces because you really couldn't talk to anybody. So when I got, when, when, when there was a little bit of time and I dove into the film, like you could see, you know, we, we got intrigued watching him live. We offered him off the film, and it was a no-brainer after our first conversation. I mean, just absolute no-brainer because he was so easy to talk to. He had, he, he had fluidity. He could shoot the ball. And answer to your question, there were a lot of things. The number one thing he had to learn was the speed of the game. Mm-hmm. and 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 how to play faster and we supposed spent a lot of time with him guarding guards that freshman mm-hmm. year in practice in the summer him getting beat him not really understanding yet how to control the ball he wanted to but he was probably still up too high and even though he had those strong legs he didn't necessarily have the flexibility yet and so he did a great job with our strength program he did a, we spent a lot of time in the sand pit a lot of time with hurdles sprints you know, all these different things, and he got much more comfortable playing low longer and mm-hmm. guarding people. And it's something that we've always tried to do. I mean, I've never wanted big men that couldn't guard guards, just like I don't want guards that can't guard bigs. If they're going to play in the NBA, they've got to be able to guard multiple people, let alone in college. And so I think the defensive versatility, getting him to talk, getting him to stay in a stance off the ball, getting his shot where he really trusted it, especially mm-hmm. in a catch and shoot, situation because he came off a lot of screens in high school but I just think once he got the speed of the game down once he understood how fast these games were once he got some confidence it took off and I'll never forget his freshman year it's January we go to Michigan mm. and and he's guarding a kid named Zach Irvin and and when you guarded John Beeline's offense you not only guarded the personnel you had to guard the keys and there were certain keys that would trigger everything else and so Zach Irvin was 6'6", pretty quick, good player on their team. And every time he got the ball at the top of the key, there was a whole situation of things that were going to happen that if you controlled the ball, those things couldn't happen. And OG came out of nowhere that night, and and we ended up being down by a bunch to the point where we won by over 20. And I swear that OG keyed our team's energy defensively on our comeback that night in the first half. And he made a three, and he started to make a three every game, and he and he got more and more of a role every game because he was comfortable. And we don't win the Big Ten championship that year without him coming off the bench doing the things that he did. I mean, we beat Kentucky in uh, Des Moines, Iowa, and it's another one of those games like that 76er game. He might be guarding an inside guy like mm-hmm. Marcus Lee, uh, but he also might be guarding Tyler Ulis, who was the player of the year yeah. in the league at five foot nine, and not letting him get by him. I mean. That's when the intrigue for the NBA really picked up. And by that summer and spring, it was there was no question he was on the road to being a lottery pick. Wow. That, that's that's great stuff, man. Salute to everybody in the chat once again. Hit the like button, hit the share button, and subscribe to the channel. KFTV's Lunchtime Live simulcast. We are live on YouTube, on Bleacher Report, Facebook, and Twitter as well. Uh, shout out to Bulls fan all day on the Bleacher Report. Says, I miss Tom Crean at IU. Class act. So shout out to uh, Bulls fan all day checking in with us on the Bleacher Report as well. All of my franchise channel members on the YouTube side, go ahead and throw a custom emoji in the chat and let us know that you guys are in here. 
Okay, coach. They make the blockbuster trade for Macau Bridges. What do you? What is Tom Thibodeau thinking about right now? I mean, he never takes a day off. Now he's got two of the best defensive wings in the NBA. You have Tatum and Brown in Boston. You have the Greek freak Giannis and and Chris Middleton. You have uh, Paul George, Joel Embiid. I mean, how is Thibodeau going to deploy these these two wings here on a nightly basis? Well, I think in the fact that you've got Hart that's such a tough defender, Jalen Brunson. I mean, there's so many guys that he has. But when you have two guys like that, there's really no there's no matchups that you don't have an answer for. There's no actions that you don't have an answer for. And there's no – they the, not only can those guys take people away and not only can they switch, but they can play another half a man because they're so quick in recovery. And I think that's the thing that, that – OG's got some unique traits. And I think Bridges has got these two. The contact balance of, of OG Ananobi, that's something that we worked so hard on to get our players to understand and get our strength program to understand – how important that was. Like, Dwayne Wade has that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Anthony Edwards has truly got that. Break, break, and, can you break that down a little bit? What's contact yeah, balance? It, it's, like, it's like, okay, whether you initiate the hit or whether you take the hit, you've got to be able to stay on balance. And so much mm-hmm. of that is staying low. So much of that is, is, is if, if you hit a guy in the – this is why, like, Julius Randle is unguardable when he drops that left shoulder, shoulder bump, into people because people like aren't braced for that Mm -hmm. right and he hits you and he turns around and that's just a matter if he's going to miss or make it to me that's contact balance Julius Randle has very good contact balance too many times his defender doesn't Mm -hmm. so it's almost like you're going to get hit there's going to be contact do you get knocked off stride do you continue to to keep coming can you recover with your feet or with your hands do you know the difference can you defend off both hands with both feet You know, there's so many things that go into it, but it's really just think of bracing for a hit, right? And and, and when you're hit or if you hit, okay, everybody's going to move, obviously, right? But do they move to the point where there's an advantage gained for the other? And we're always trying to teach our guys what that advantage is like on both sides. Nick, that's why Nick Claxton, I think, was able to do what he was able to do. Certainly, you've got to get stronger, but you've Mm got to play. There's so much that goes in to your midsection right to your hips to your core and 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 any anybody that wants to train their kids or anybody that's listening to this that plays like you can't do enough to make sure that your midsection is right that those hips are flexible and you can turn them that you play with strong feet mm-hmm. you know contact balance is a full body deal and to me it's being able to play through that it's being able to cover the second dribble you know without playing from behind and, and like our USA team right now has got to get better at that all of a sudden. They're getting mm-hmm. caught uh, on the side too much or behind too much on the ball, right? So all of a sudden the offensive team, and our, our, our USA team has an advantage when they do it as well. Mm-hmm. But, the, but the offensive guards and the other teams in, in, these, in, these, in these pre-Olympic games, they have an advantage on our, our, our wings over there because they're getting them on the side because mm-hmm. they're not ready to maybe take that first hit when it comes or guard that first dribble. And – to me, that's what contact balance is. I could talk about it forever because you got to work on that. But you also have to be able to uh, – you got to be able to use your whole body, man. I mean, you got to be able to use both arms. Uh, like a big, big thing to me is can you defend with both hands? You know, can you challenge shots with both hands? That's why I would always like – and we would we would show film to our guys, especially a guy like OG. Mm-hmm. We would show film of a Jimmy Butler. We would show – especially Tom's team. We, there were two things we always showed – with Tom Thibodeau's teams, how they defended coming around screens and how their bigs defended the ball screen with active hands. And it's mm. just, Tom has been at such a high level with that for so long. And I'm not saying he's the only one, but those are not going to be weaknesses on his teams. So you get back to that question with Bridges and OG, they can do all those things. They can defend all those situations. They're going to get deflections. Mikel Bridges was raised on deflections. OG Ananobi was raised on deflections. They're raised on activity of the ball. You're going to have to go around them or over them to make a pass. You're never going through them hmm. because they're so active with their bodies and they use them. And, and that to me is, is what great defense is. And the contact balance, the quickness and recovery, all right, and the ability and quickness and recovery so many times being able to move on the pass. Right. And you see so many times when people are out of a stance or they're lazy, they move on the catch of the ball and they're late. 
rather than moving on the airtime of the pass, pass of the ball with their hands up, getting a pivot into a closeout. And like Bridges and OG are tremendous at that. And that fits right in with what Tom's doing because he's teaching that. He's teaching flybys. He's teaching all that every day.